University of Law in Israel. She earned her LLB from Tel Aviv University and a JSD and LLM from Columbia Law School. She teaches and researches in the area of international and constitutional law, focusing on the intersection between international law and domestic law, and between law and political theory. And she has published uh, extensively in these areas. And she will talk on the HCJ decision on the regularization bill. The second speaker is advocate Yoav Harris, who graduated from the law faculty of Haifa University and served as a litigator and a partner in the leading law firms practicing in maritime law and commercial litigation. Advocate Harris was also a guest lecturer here at the International Law Forum at the Hebrew University, covering maritime and commercial issues such as the Iran-Israel arbitration and the Haifa Maritime Court's decision concerning prize law and he will speak about border disputes between Israel and Lebanon. And the third speaker is Dr. Gilad Noam, who is a senior director of the International Justice Division at the Ministry of Justice, and is also a lecturer here at the Hebrew University, where he teaches courses on international criminal law. He earned his LLB, LNM, and PhD from the Hebrew University and clerked for the Honorable Judge Dorit Benish, and he will talk about developments in the ICC. So, Tamar, you have the floor, please. Thank you. Can I share a presentation? It's just uh, four slides, but I think it would be helpful to have them in front of us. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay thank you. Um, so, I'm going to use my uh, 12 minutes, broadly defined, to present uh, uh, shortly present in, um, the high, the Supreme Court decision, High Court of Justice decision, uh, in the case of Silwad, which, um, as uh, most of you know, I assume, uh, invalidated the settlement regularization law. Um, I'm going to go over very quickly over the law, over the decision, and then I'm going to analyze what I think is, there's a lot to be said about this decision, but I, what I view as one of the most important aspects or angles of the decision, which is, how the Supreme Court um, con con uh, examined or conducted constitutional review of international, what is essentially an international law violation. Um, so this relationship between constitutional law, but my focus or my angle for um, reviewing this, this law decision will be the relationship between international law and constitutional law. So, um, as uh, you know, the decision the decision was uh, rendered was given by the Supreme Court on June 9th, 2020. And the decision invalidated the settlement regula regularization law, which was enacted by the Knesset uh, in 2017. The court invalidated the law by an eight to one majority, and determining that it violated the constitutional rights to property, dignity, and equality protected by basic law, human dignity, and liberty, and did not meet the requirements of the basic law's limitation clause. Now, a few uh, words about the settlement regularization law itself um, before we move on to examine the decision. The first point um, I want to address regard the content of the law. What the law essentially does is create a mechanism for expropriation of private Palestinian land on which Israeli settlement were built in good faith, which is a term that is very broadly defined in the law, um, and which allows for um, transferring usage rights, basically the rights to live on the land, essentially eventually to the Israeli settlers that are already living on the land. So this is what the law was set to do. This is the purpose of the law. The law was enacted after following a political crisis that emerged after the Supreme Court ordered um, the evacuation of Amona, which was a settlement built on private Palestinian land. Um, it caused stir in Israeli society. It caused stir in the Knesset. It led eventually um, to the enactment of the law, despite the fact that the law will not apply to, was not was not supposed to apply to Amona itself, um, but it was uh, portrayed as a way to solve future such case, future problems and to ensure that more Jewish settlements will not be required to be um, evacuated. The second point um, I want to point out before moving to the decision is the form of the law. The law is unique in the sense that it departs from the way Israel regularly or generally 
operates in the, in the OPTs, in the occupied territories in the West Bank, and from a legal perspective. So generally, the normative framework that applies to the OPTs, that applies to the West Bank, is an international law of occupation framework, an IHL framework. Um, so the law that applies is the Jordanian law, and on top of that, Israel operates through military order. And judicial review of Israel acts in the West Bank is generally judicial review of military orders. So if you have a lot of cases over the years reviewing Israeli actions, but most of them are, are reviews of military orders. Here we have a departure from this mode of operation since the settlement regularization law is primary Knesset legislation that purports to apply in the West Bank. So this is the Knesset acting in the West Bank and not uh, a military order of within a framework of the an I, of IHL. What are the main uh, arguments that were made in the, the petitions against the law and what is the angle through which the court chose to eventually invalidate the law? So the petitioners made three, and they made a lot of arguments, but they can be characterized or classified into three main types of arguments. The first argument is that the law is void since the Knesset has no authority to legislate in the OPTs. Um, so this is basically something that this is basically a lack of authority argument saying that we don't even need to examine the content of the law because the very act of the Knesset is void. The second line of argument or, or the second um, category is regards the incompatibility or the violation of incompatibility with or violation of international law. So this line, under this, this line of argument, um, the main claims are that the law should be invalidated since it is incompatible um, with international law of occupation, it is incompatible with um, IHL, which prohibits a taking of private land and of pri private property, except for very, very narrow uh, exceptions, which do not apply in this case. And that since the normative framework that applies in the OPTs, that applies in the West Bank is in IHL, um, the last should be, uh, should, be invalid, should be invalidated. The third line of argument was a constitutional law line of argument. So here the petitioners argued that the law should be invalidated since it is incompatible with basic law, human dignity and liberty, since it violates rights that are protected in the basic law, which is essentially an Israeli constitutional norm. So it is incompatible with in Israeli constitutional law, um, which include the right to uh, property, the right to dignity, the right to equality, um, and a few and other rights. And it does not fulfill the requirements of Article 8 of the Basic Law, which determines that there shall be no violation of rights under this Basic Law, except by a law befitting the values of the State of Israel, enacted for a proper purpose, and to the extent no greater than is required. So three, very, three separate um, types of argument by the, the petitioners. What are... Um, how do the respondents respond to these claims? Um, and this, um, I think, perhaps the mo most uh, interesting, one of the interesting points in, in the decision is that the court decided not to decide on the authority of the Knesset to enact the law, on the authority of the Knesset to legislate in the OPTs. Um, and it also, and then it found itself um, and it chose to focus on the constitutional law perspective. I'm going to go back to the international law perspective in a second, but it chose to, to focus on the constitutional law perspective. And here an issue arised, and the issue that arised was, well, if the Knesset has no authority to legislate in the OPTs, or if it is argued, or if this question is not, is not determined, how are we to address the issue of whether con Israeli constitutional law applies in the OPTs. And the court has addressed its issues uh, in various uh, instances in, in the past, that Professor Kretschmer and Professor Ronan that are here with us have uh, written about this topic extensively, but there's no general kind of coherent agenda of the application of Israeli constitutional law 
in, in, in the OPTs. Now the court found, tried to find a way around this question. And what basically the decision states, what Justice Hayut said in her decision is she said, we don't have to decide on this question. We can assume that both parties um, agree that in any case, the basic law applies. We can rely on this agreement and we, um, and in any case, the Knesset, if the Knesset has, the, wherever the Knesset has an authority to legislate, the law will always be subject to constitutional review to the basic laws. Um, and because this is the case, we can examine the decision from the perspective of Israeli constitutional law. So this is the main paradigm, the main perspective, the main angle th um, through which um, the validity of the law is examined. And within this angle, arised another question, which was, well, if this is mainly a constitutional law this is question, if this is mainly a constitutional law case, what is the role of international law? Now, the respondents presented a very um, clear argument or clear position. And what the respondents said, the respondents argued that A, the expropriation mechanism itself does not violate international law, but that even if it did, it doesn't matter. And the reason why it doesn't matter is because under Israeli rules of incorporation of international law in Israel, um, which determine the status of international law within Israel and which, and which the court has to abide by, once there is an uh, act of the Knesset, once there is explicit Knesset legislation, it supersedes international law. And since the settlement law was an act of the Knesset, in case of conflict between um, international law and legislation, legislation should prevail. Justice Hill did not um, address or respond to this question uh, explicitly. What, but what she did do, and I think this is perhaps one of the most interesting aspects of the decisions, and one that might be relevant beyond this particular case, and even perhaps beyond cases that regard the, um, the OPTs, that regard the West Bank, is state that international law was relevant within the course of constitutional adjudication. So what basically determined is that when we examine the validity of the law under Israeli constitutional law, international law is still relevant. It, we, it, still fi it finds its way into the constitutional exam the, to, ex to exam the examination of the constitutionality of the law. And I want to give you two examples, and I think that is my, I'm going to use my last three minutes. Um, to give you these two examples of two places in the decision um, where Hayu turns to international law in the course of constitutional review. Um, one example is in examining whether the law was enacted for a proper purpose. So, so the limitation clause of basic law, human dignity and liberty determines that a law violating rights, and I skip the part, but I perhaps should say first that Hayut concluded that there is here a violation of the right to property, the right to equality, um, and so on. So I put, once there is a, a violation of a particular right, of, of a particular right, we need to move to the limitation clause, and we need to examine whether the law was enacted for a proper purpose. And here, here Hayut proposed the distinction between what she called the systemic purpose, to retroactively validate illegal building in the occupied territories through the taking of private property, and the humane purpose, which was to alleviate the harm that would be caused to settlers who have established their homes in the settlement in good faith. And she determined that while the humane purpose was legitimate, the systemic purpose was not. And within this, determ in, in, in this determination, she refers to IHL and uh, its prohibitions on uh, the taking of private land. The second place in the decision, where Hayut turns to international law, is in examining the proportionality of the law. So Hayut determines that the law 
is not proportional. And basically, eventually, it is invalidated on the grounds that it is not proportional. But within the examination of proportionality, she stresses that the status of um, the petitioners as protected persons under IHL should be relevant and should be taken into consideration. She states at the beginning of the decision that there are, in this case, normative sources in, in international law, which must be addressed in the course of constitutional review. And the implication, or I think that the, 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 the bottom line with this decision is that despite the fact that the court does not state explicitly that it has changed the balance of the relationship between international law and constitution between international law and domestic law and despite the fact that formally primary knesset legislation prevails over inter customary international law at least in this decision this is not exactly the case because despite the fact that there is primary the Knesset legislation, international law comes in back through the back door during the course of constitutional review. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Tamar. Um, so we are going to continue straight to the uh, lecture of Yoav. Yoav, please. Yes. Okay, thank you. I would also kindly ask to share screen to present my presentation. Um, okay. Okay, everybody can hear me? Yes. Okay, we get started. Thank you, Shani. In the year 2010, the United States Geological Survey estimated the natural gas uh, reserves in the Eastern Mediterranean Basin uh, at about 3,400 BCM. For the most part, these fields were located offshore from Israel, Cyprus, and Lebanon in what is known as the Levant Basin. The Israeli gas fields, Tamar, Dalit, and Leviathan, were estimated at 714 BCM. For comparative purposes, Israel's natural gas consumption for the year 2010 was 5.2 BCM only. The relevant offshore rights recognized by International Maritime Law Convention, the Onkelos, as economic waters, which prima facie are the waters extending 200 miles from the offshore from the baselines of each state. Under the convention, each state had the right to exploit for its purposes the natural resources situated in the economic waters themselves or in the underlying sea bottom and ledges. The convention also permits the adjoining states to establish installations in the economic waters relating to the exploitation of resources in their economic zone. The convention relates to and takes into account of disputes with adjoining states or states situated opposite each other in order to establish establish what waters constitute the economic zone of each such state. In these circumstances, the convention obliges the relevant states to arrive at an equitable solution in a spirit of understanding and cooperation. In the absence of a solution, the convention provides for a number of solutions such as conciliation, international arbitration, the International Tribunal ITCOS, or referral to the International Court of Justice, the ICG. In the year 2007, an agreement was signed between Lebanon and Cyprus for the deviation of economic waters between them. Under the agreement, the boundary of the economic waters is the line which transgresses six points from the south to north, with the southmost point being point number one. Cyprus ratified the agreement in 2009, but Lebanon did not do so, presumably in order not to antagonize Turkey, which does not recognize any agreement considering Cyprus' economic waters which does not include the rights of what is called the Turkish Cyprus. In May, July and October 2009, Lebanon filed with the Secretary General of the United Nations a list of coordinates defining it what is considered to be its economic waters, which differs from those points agreed upon by Lebanon and Cyprus, Cyprus which in particular include two further points which are not in Lebanon's agreement with Cyprus, point number 23, in the area of the border with Israel and point number seven in the north. In 2010, Israel and Cyprus established the division of economic waters between them. Under this agreement, the boundary is that which passes through 12 points from north to south. The most northern point in the Cyprus-Israel agreement 
is the point number one with the effect that the economic season between Israel and Cyprus starts from point number one and continues to the south. In this manner, the northern boundary of Israel's economic waters is the southern boundary of the Lebanese economic waters as agreed between Lebanon and Cyprus. In 2011, Israel lodged it with the Security General of the United Nations a list of coordinates constituting its economic waters as a state having a seaboard. <coughs> as arises from the letters and documents sent by each of the states to the Secretary General of the United Nations, over the years, it's, it's, it is possible to identify the nature of the disputes of areas of disagreement between Israel and Lebanon as follows. Israel claims that the northern point of its economic uh, zone extends from point number one in the west in the sea to a specific point in the, in the shore in, in Russian Ikra, known as point 31, while it's Lebanon contains that the southern border of its economic zone extends from point 23 in the west to a point, specific point on the shore named at Vast Makura being point B1. In fact, the shoreline distance between the Israeli point 31 and the Lebanese point B1 is only 25.55 meters. However, when you stretch the lines towards the border with the maritime zone of Cyprus, you will receive a disputed area of 850, 850 square kilometers. This area extends over blocks one to three in the map of license for exploitation of gas of the Israeli Ministry of Energy. In practice, no activity of exploration and exploitation have taken place in the disputed areas of blocks one, two, and three. <coughs> the closed fields or Karish and North Karish, which are exploited by energy and oil and gas, which also exploit the Tanin field, and adjacent thereto is the oil search exploitation area known as Alon D3 D367. The director for the exploitation of oil at the Energy at the Ministry of Energy instructed the license holder of a loan D367 not to drill in the area covered by the license at the request of the Foreign, Gen Foreign Gen Ministry, the Defense Ministry, and the Malal, all of which for political and security consideration wish to prevent disputes in the matter of Israel's maritime economic zone with a hostile state, Lebanon. Just to in, a, in order to place the economic interest in the correct perspective, it should be noted that in a notice issued by Energy and in April 2019 in London, the estimate arising from the exploratory drilling in Karish Field indicated the production of natural gas in Karish Field uh, at about 28 to 42 BCM. In a prior notice appearing in Israel's press, Energy and signed supply contracts with Israeli interests for the annual supply of natural gas uh, of more than 4 BCM from the Karish and Tanil fields. The Lebanese contention relating to the shoreline point B1 is based on the mapping of the border by England and France in 1923 by the means of the joint committee headed by Paulette of France and Newcomb of England. The Paulette Newcomb committee was preceded by negotiations between England and France dating from 1919 following the end of the First World War where England believed that the French contribution to the war effort was not as expected, having regard also to the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which was concluded during the war in 1960, and the new circumstances and interests, such as the British Declaration, exp expressed by the British Foreign Minister Lord Balfour, relating to the establishment of a Jewish state in Palestine, <coughs> and the necessity of establishing water sources for the Jewish population in the Galil, which necessitated a new definition of the border. In 1923, Britain and France adopted the conclusion of the Pilot Newcomb Committee in relation to the border of the British and French mandates. However, in practice, the area was demarcated by temporary border stones and in military maps on a scale of 1 to 100,000, which do not permit an exact demarcation of the border between the two countries. The result is that in relation to the shoreland boundary of Lebanon, the Lebanese contingents or based on alleged border democration, which is not definitive, and in which in any event has not been agreed as a definitive binding boundary with the neighboring state of the south, Israel, which Lebanon in any event does not recognize. In relation to the sea boundaries contended by Lebanon, this is in conflict with the boundary points agreed by Lebanon and Cyprus in the agreement which was ratified by Cyprus. A further difficulty 
face in Lebanon is that Israel, as opposed to Lebanon and Cyprus, has not ratified the Oculus Convention, precluding Israel from being subject to the jurisdiction of judicial institutions stated in the Convention. It seems that of the three states, Cyprus, Lebanon, and Israel, Lebanon has the greatest interest in a regional cooperation in that not only does the political situation in Lebanon prevent it from precluding oil and gas from within its economic maritime border, also the only land connection of Lebanon with Europe is through an unstable Syria. Therefore, it seems that a suggest, for example, of a common pipeline through Cyprus and Greece or liquid gas installations serving the three countries would certainly serve Lebanon's interest if Lebanon intends to exploit the energy sources at the bottom of the sea of its economic maritime zone and enable it to be an energy exporter with all the influence that it would attract. Leaving the area in a dispute and undeveloped does not serve the interest of any of the parties and developing the area under a division will only improve the existing economic positions of both parties. A willingness to enter into a compromise agreement would result in a substantial economic benefit. For the purpose of allowing the delegations of the two parties to succeed with the discussions taking place these days, following the efforts of the American administration, and especially the Secretary of State for the Mediterranean, David Satterfield, it might be worth referring to the story of the pipeline as follows. In 1947, an American company began the laying of the pipeline, the Trans-Arabian Pipeline for the carriage of oil from the west of Saudi Arabia to Lebanon. The establishment of a state of Israel complicated the original intention of laying the pipeline to the port of Haifa, and the pipeline's course was changed to pass through the area known as Golan Heights, which at that time was controlled by Syria, and from there to the port of Sidon. At the time, 1950, the pipeline was the largest in the world, carrying half a million barrels of oil per day through Saudi Arabia, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon. Following Israel's victory in the Six-Day War, that port of the pipeline, which traverses the Golan Heights for a distance of 47 kilometers, became under the Israeli control. However, <coughs> Israel permitted the continued use of the pipeline through Golan Heights and the pipeline was inactive until 1976 when it was replaced by the use of oil tankers carrying uh, oil and transmitting it through navigation through the Suez Canal. If one so wishes, the use of the pipeline constitutes an example of cooperation, albeit passive, between Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Lebanon and Israel in the context of exploitation and the use of energy sources. It might be that history in the above context will repeat itself and hopefully it will be done currently and these days. So I hope I was within the 12 minutes limit. I did practice for that. Perfect. And, uh, thank you very much. Thank you also for Tal and Yuval for letting me in and uh, I think we have got more time for questions. I finished right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yoav. Um, so we continue straight for Gilad's presentation. Gilad, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank the organizers. Uh, thank you, Shani, for the introduction. It's, uh, I'm really happy to be here and to see so many familiar faces and uh, so many friends. I just mentioned that uh, presently I'm also uh, teaching at the uh, College of Management and some of my uh, present uh, students uh, are also here. So uh, it's really go good to see that we can uh, preserve the, the form also in these difficult times and hope, hopefully we can meet uh, next year. Uh, let me begin by uh, stating, uh, as always, that any opinion that I may express here does not necessarily uh, reflect the position of the uh, government uh, of Israel. Uh, it is perhaps my position at the Ministry of Justice that uh, led to the uh, inclusion of my presentation in the panel on uh, international law in the Middle East, or perhaps it is the fact that I uh, discuss a report issued by a group of experts headed by Judge uh, Richard uh, Goldstone, who's well known here for the famous uh, Goldstone Report uh, on the Gaza conflict. Uh, anyway, I, I'll be speaking about a global development uh, that may have, of course, uh, implication also here in the Middle East, and I think uh, uh, Tal uh, may maybe alluded uh, to some of them, uh, but that wouldn't be the focus uh, of, my, uh, of my presentation. Um, th those who uh, closely uh, 
uh, follow the work of the International Criminal Court are most likely aware of the fact that this is a crucial period uh, in the short history of the court. Even the court's most ardent supporters have raised questions about its performance, each having a different view on the direction to which the court should steer itself. Regardless uh, of the direction the court should take, an important aspect of the court's work that should be taken into consideration as part of any initiative aimed at improving its function is the use of its limited resources. Um, as an illustration, throughout the years and since its formation, the court's budget has significantly, significantly grown reaching a total of almost 2 billion US dollars from 2003 until today. Yet, at the same time, the court has not managed to accomplish satisfactory results. Out of 37 cases brought before the court's chambers, only 11 matured to the trial phase. Ultimately, the court's office uh, of the prosecutor had only managed to bring about the conviction of four defendants in almost uh, or more than uh, 18 uh, years. In light of the numbers such as those I have just presented, as well as many internal and external struggles the court has, be, has been facing, in uh, December 2019, just a year ago, the Assembly of State Parties to the Rome Statute decided to adopt a resolution that established the Independent Expert Review. Um, the assembly elected nine individuals to carry out the project, and its overall mandate was to identify ways to strengthen the ICC and the Rome Statute system in order to promote universal recognition of their central role in the global fight against impunity and enhance their overall function. Thus, the experts were tasked with making concrete, I quote, concrete, achievable, and actionable recommendations aimed at enhancing the performance, efficiency, and effectiveness of the court and the Rome system as a whole. The experts were further mandated to make the recommendations to the assembly and the court on specific complex technical issues under three clusters of issues, governance, judiciary, and the third cluster, preliminary examinations, investigations and prosecutions. At their first plenary, the experts appointed Richard Goldstone, that I mentioned before, as the chair. The experts submitted an interim report on June this year, 2020. Uh, the full report containing almost four, a 400 recommendations, to be accurate, 384 recommendations, both short and long term, was made public on 30th September 2020. A couple of weeks ago, the, the, um, the Assembly adopted by consensus a resolution according to which a review mechanism under the auspices of the Assembly will be established with the aim of planning, coordinating, keeping track, and regularly reporting to the Assembly, to the Assembly Presidency, on the uh, assessment of the recommendations uh, contained in the report. Um, I would say that one of the biggest challenges stemming from the report and more generally from the structure and function of the court is that of the balance between being a judicial institution as well as an international organization. As the experts themselves have put it, and I quote, as a judicial entity, the court must benefit from judicial independence. As an international organization, states' parties reasonably expect to be able to guide and shape the institution. Um, it is interesting to reflect and think on the report's recommendations and the manner in which they may be implemented through this prism. I wouldn't have time to elaborate about that, so I just, I'm just throwing that out and maybe we'll have time in the, in the Q&A phase. Uh, to discuss this issue in view of some of the issues that I, I will elaborate upon uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, my aim today is to focus mostly on the part of the report that deals with prosecutorial strategies of selection, prioritization, hibernation, and closure of situations and cases. Or in other words, how broad 
should the court open its doors when deciding which situations to address and pursue and which situations and cases, cases should be left out considering the mandate of the court and its limited resources. Before addressing this part of the report, uh, I'll just take a very brief uh, overview of uh, other issues that uh, dealt by the uh, group of experts. Uh, this, these issues include uh, the uh, working environment within the court, the working culture, structure, management, and organization. Um, the experts uh, put forward uh, recommendations in order to uh, tackle troubling findings regarding this issue and many more. The report further deals with the court's different organs, the registry, the uh, chambers, the uh, prosecution. Regarding the office of the prosecutor, the experts compiled numerous recommendations touching upon different aspects of the office's work. As such, they emphasized, among other, the need to undertake peer evidence review and to institute a process of rigorous testing of the trial readiness of cases between the confirmation of uh, charges and the co commencement of the trial. This may allude to the uh, low rate of uh, convictions as well as uh, in state strong and cooperation agreements with national authorities. Th this is but a glimpse to the thorough and comprehensive report by the independent experts. The report sheds light as well as offers ob observations on many more issues, the court budget, recruitment processes, prevention of conflict of interest or ethical misconduct, its relations with external bodies such as the United Nations and civil society, many, many more uh, issue issues. Uh, I will now uh, focus on the recommendations that specifically relate to prioritization of situations and cases. As I mentioned, international institutions such as the ICC uh, have limited resources. Thus, they should be very carefully utilized, these resources. The Rome Statute established the ICC as a court of last resort, as we all know founded upon the principle of complementarity. The experts acknowledge that as a court of last resort, the ICC cannot and should not be expected to prosecute each individual responsible to the commission of Rome Statute crimes. The experts have formulated several recommendations that are specifically aimed at addressing the way in which the prosecution handles the high volume of potential situations uh, and cases, taking into account its limited resources. Particular notice should be given to the recommendations that relate to the Rome Statute's own mechanisms, which are highly relevant in this context, and I mean the mechanism of complementarity and gravity. The, these are very important tools. So first, about gravity. In one of the uh, experts' recommendations, and now I quote, they say, in order to address the disparity between the prosecution resources and the high number of preliminary examinations resulting in investigations, the prosecutor should consider adopting a higher threshold for the gravity of the crimes alleged to have been perpetrated. Gravity should also be taken into account at phase one of preliminary examinations. To be clear, phase one is the phase before opening a preliminary examination. It's the phase in which the prosecution says, we are not even going to deal with the issue as a preliminary matter because on the face of it, this is not the type of, of things that the court should deal with. This recommendation, of course, adds in, in, in contradiction to the actual practice of the courts nowadays, and as an Israelis, and here is the Middle East perspective of the, of the presentation, we all know, of course, of the uh, uh, flotilla to Gaza uh, situation, which uh, did not result uh, in uh, uh, filtering the situation out in phase one. It resulted in a, in a, in a very long saga before the prosecution at first and then before the judges. Um, and just very recently, the judges uh, uh, rejected another attempt to appeal, uh, to appeal the decision. Um, let, let, let me move to another uh, uh, recommendation. These are just some, some, some examples. And again, I quote, um, 
the OTP should devise a policy for the prioritization, deprioritization, and hibernation of situations. It should contain the criteria and benchmarks to guide the strategic planning in each situations. situation. Such plans should also include the activities that are necessary during the deprioritization or hibernation of a situation in order to ensure that the situation remains viable and capable of reactivation. The experts note that the prosecutor's current approach to complementarity and positive complementarity is one of the main reasons for some of the lengthy preliminary examinations. Particularly, complementarity questions arise in relation to two aspects of the uh, prosecution approach to preliminary examinations. The legal and factual analysis of complementarity for the assessment of uh, jurisdiction and the engagement by the prosecution in positive complementarity activities. And the expert says that both have proven to be problematic in practice and have significantly, significantly extended the length of some of the preliminary examinations. So I see that my time is up, so I, I, I'll just conclude by some thoughts about the future path for, for the court, also, also in light of these uh, recommendations. The ICC is at a crossroads uh, today. It is clear that the present policy cannot be sustained. The need to focus on a very few number of situations and cases of utmost gravity and to conduct a few but effective and highly professional investigations is crucial for the court's success, legitimacy, and to promote the universality of, it, of the court as envisioned by the drafters of the Rome Statute. Um, changes and reforms can be the result of internal processes within the court but also the result of the actions of the assembly of state parties, including by adopting amendments to the Rome Statute, or maybe by using the assembly's power to, um, uh, to approve the budget of the court. The next chief prosecutor to replace the present prosecutor, Ben Suda, in June 2021, should have been elected by the assembly in the session that ended last week. But failing to reach a consensus on any of the candidates, the assembly will continue to consider the issue in early 2021. The newly elected prosecutor will have to deal with numerous challenges, with numerous challenges. His or her predecessor acknowledging the need to reassess the issue of prioritization of situation stated recently, just in the last few weeks, with relation to the decisions to move from the preliminary examination stage to the investigation phase in the situations in Nigeria and in Ukraine, that the prosecutor intends, I quote, to consult with the incoming new prosecutor once elected on the strategic and operational issues related to prioritization of the office's workload and the filing of necessary applications before the pretrial chamber. Namely, whether to move forward, how to move forward, what to prioritize, what shouldn't be prioritized. There is no doubt that 2021 is a critical year for the court and for the future of international criminal justice. Thank you. Thank you, Gilad. So we open the floor for questions. So if anyone uh, wants to ask questions, please raise your hand or ask in the chat. So, Yuval, you, you have a question, please. Thank you. I have a question for Gilad. I see also uh, Professor Francis Radai uh, also uh, uh, wrote a question. So maybe Gilad can, uh, can look at that as well. Uh, so, so my question is really whether Gilad sees um, a connection between uh, uh, the difficulties that he has been describing and the attempts by first the, the chamber, in the pretrial chamber in the Afghanistan case and now the prosecutor in the UK case to, to basically, um, uh, how to put it mildly, to pe uh, reject jurisdiction over cases that involve uh, a advanced uh, democracy, so to speak, with a strong uh, internal investigation capacity. 
uh, despite uh, evidence showing that they are not really interested in employing this? Uh, and do you think, A, is it connect connected? I mean, are the dots connected? And secondly, is this a sustainable path for the core to pursue? Well, we can't hear you. Just heard a one question and, and, and I didn't hear the end of it because I was cut off and I didn't hear what Francis uh, said. No, okay, so uh, Val is back and Francis is here, so just repeat the questions for Gilad. Um, Val, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, uh, so, so Gilad, you, I think you heard most of my question about the UK, uh, US cases and whether it's sustainable for the court to pursue such a strategy. Um, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, and, and what is the takeaway for maybe for Israel also uh, for, from, the, from this propensity? And Francis, you want to complete your question? So yes. Okay. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, firstly, I enjoyed the lecture, Gilad. I found it very interesting. Um, and I was asking, what is it about the proceedings? I mean, I recognize that there are translation difficulties, all kinds of difficulties. But what is it about the proceedings before the International Criminal Court that have made the proceedings so impossibly cumbersome resulting in very high costs, very long trials, very low success rates from the prosecutor's point of view. And was there anything in the report to say how one could change that aspect of the uh, ICC? Um, okay, so, so thank, you, thank you for the uh, questions. Uh, first, uh, to, to Yuval question, I think um, maybe the... Uh, the decision, the, the first decision in Afghanistan and the uh, decision now of the prosecutor with regard to Currently, uh, it seems very, very strange. If you read, uh, for example, the, the prosecutor reports on, on the UK, uh, and you read uh, what she wrote uh, in the preliminary examinations report about, the, about Gaza, for example, uh, we also have a, have a system, and uh, I, I, I can say here that uh, we, we, we made sure that the uh, prosecutor and the, the conclusions with regard to the UK, uh, and, and again, the way that the uh, that complementarity was implemented uh, seems to, seem to point to the right result. I do think that the, the result is the, is the right one. I don't think that the court can, can, can deal with such situation uh, successfully. And I think it's a, it's a typical situation to be dealt nationally. The question that we should ask is why it took them so long uh, to do so? And does or do the uh, current legal tests adopted by the court fit, uh, fit, fit the result. And the question is problematic in, in that regard. I think that the court should say it straightforward. We are now changing the policy. The drafters originally meant that we will be complementary to national jurisdiction, not only in terms of admissibility, not only in terms of the wordings of Article 17, but more generally. And if the UK has a functioning system with all its many, many problems, many problems, and if they deal with these problems publicly, discuss them, address them, we will not intervene, point. 
we will focus on the most important issues. Um, with regard to Afghanistan, uh, I should say that the, in the expert review report, they said, they said that they do not adopt the approach that prospect of success should be a criterion for uh, assessing whether to move forward uh, 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 or not, at least not officially. But I guess there is a place for such a criterion as part of a general prosecutorial uh, discretion. Uh, I do think that what the judges in the first Afghanistan decision wish to signify is that you have a tool there. It calls interest of justice in the Rome Statute. Use it. Use it. The uh, expert report the, 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 does not say anything about it. But generally speaking, I think it is now the time for states, for the community of states that care about the court, to go back to the original intentions of the dra drafter and focus the court on how to use these tools uh, rightly and appropriately. As to Francis' uh, uh, question, I think there is an in inherent difficulty in uh, international criminal proceedings being taking place uh, far away from the crime scenes uh, with the many complexities of uh, language uh, disparities and, and other, uh, other difficulties. And for that reasons, I think the court cannot spread itself over so many situations. Investigation that would lead eventually to convictions, you must be very focused, very professional with regard to very few situations. It takes a lot to be professional and to know the crime scene, not only technically, but also in many other respects uh, that uh, are sometimes unique to uh, different uh, situations. And as the ICTY and the ICTR were professional in their own specific situations, I think that now everyone should uh, acknowledge that a project of international criminal court cannot be a project of a world international criminal court. The international community should be very precise and the court should be very precise in saying, okay, in the next de decade, I don't know, the one or maximum two situations that we will focus upon, which uh, involve the most serious crimes of concern to the international community uh, as a whole are this and this. This is where we'll focus our intention. intention. Of course, these should be also situations that in which the prospect of success and the ability to, to, to achieve a support by states in order for the trial to be as effective as possible, to have as many evidence as possible, I think this is also a crucial uh, criterion. Um, thank you. The next question is from Dave Kretschmer. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I have a question comment for tomorrow. First of all, I want to thank you very much because you gave a, a really excellent and precise presentation on the relationship between international law and constitutional law in the decision of the court. But it seems to me that the most important point in international court, uh, of international law in the court's decision is what the court didn't do. And as we know that Article 1 or Section 1 of the law specifically says that the aim of the law is to regularize settlement in Judea and Samaria in order to enable the continuation of its, of its basis and its development. Now, clearly, if we accept the conventional view that Israeli settlement in the occupied territories is in contravention of international law, and when the court says, well, is the law for a proper purpose, the first thing that it should have done is to examine the declared purpose of the law. And the interesting thing, of course, is that I think that uh, Chief Justice uh, Chayut was very well aware of this. She was also very well aware of the fact that the Supreme Court has done whatever it could to avoid addressing the legality of Israeli settlement in the occupied territories. So what she did was to rephrase, as it were, the actual 
purpose of the law in a way which enabled her then to make this distinction which Tamar showed us between what she called the systemic purpose of the law and the humanitarian purpose of the law and that made it much easier for her to address this and the answer was actually given in the two judgments of the one judgment of the judge who dissented Justice Solberg who said you're totally confusing the question of what is the purpose of the law and whether uh, whether that is a proper purpose and whether it's proportionate and Justice uh, Hendel it seems to me he's the first judge in the Supreme Court who actually said that this is a proper purpose in other words it's the first time that the Supreme Court at least a judge on the Supreme Court has taken a stand on the legality of Israeli settlement in the occupied territories in contravention of international law. No, I agree. I think the court made here a very conscious decision to take the constitutional route and to apply a pick and choose approach from international law within this, within this perspective or the constitutional angle. But that is consistent with the way the court has approached these questions, you know, forever, this kind of pick and choose. So, who discusses the purpose, but she, what she, the, the frame she, from international law, she borrows and stresses over and over is protected person, it's protected persons, you know, this is relevant, we have to take into consideration it's protected persons. But of course she avoids the questions of, the, um, uh, of the legality of the legality of the settlement. I mean, of course, it's the elephant in the room, but there's always the elephant in the room in the Supreme Court decisions concerning the West Bank. So, in this in this respect, it's another uh, another one in a long line of cases that avoid this question. Thank you. Uh, we have two more questions. First from Dor Chai, and then uh, from Jeremy. So, Dor, please. Okay, I see it's not there. So, Jeremy, please. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, my questions for Gilad. Firstly, thank you very much for an outstanding presentation. I just want to um, draw Gilad a little bit further or more closely um, in the debates around the legitimacy and efficacy of the ICC. No question, the ICC is at crossroads. I just wanted to, um, to perhaps play a little bit of devil's advocate, if you will, because defenders of the ICC, they would say that one can't measure the success of the, the court primarily through prosecutions um, and through um, its capacity to secure convictions. But one also has to take into account the ability of the court to play a deterrent role and um, enforce its sort of soft power through positive complementarity. So I wanted to ask Gilad to comment a bit on that um, other side of the equation and whether in fact um, changing the court's policy to, for it to cast its net far less widely um, I guess defenders of the court, including um, the former prosecutor, uh, Louis, Louise moreno Campo, who you quoted, would suggest that doing so would um, be, in fact, tacitly um, validating more impunity or perhaps bolstering one of the largest and most robust criticisms against the court, which has been that the court is essentially a Western political instrument that shouldn't be used against the West, but only used against Africa. So if Gilad could comment a bit on that and just Finally, what I would have loved to have heard about is where does he think the court might rule on the question of territorial jurisdiction in Palestine? Um, we're waiting for a, um, a judgment. Does, does Gilad think that the, the ICC um, will rule on statehood or what, what's his sort of legal Nostradamus um, in terms of the, the, the question in, in, as far as it relates to our region? Um, Gilad, we have another question from Yali to you, so maybe we'll hear his question and then you can answer both okay. questions together. Thanks. Okay. Actually, my, my question was rather similar to, to uh, the first part of Jeremy's question. It seems to me that you measure the success of the court by focusing on the individual uh, prosecutions rather than the shadow of the court and its wider effect. And it seems to me that your suggestion that uh, we will announce what two situations the court will focus on 
it will right, dramatically change at least the, the potential account of the wider effect of the shadow of the court. And I wonder what's your position. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the questions. Um, I, I, I admit that uh, as in any position that you take, there is also a price for this uh, position. And we should ask ourselves, uh, and particularly taking into account the present situation that the court uh, is in, what we lose or may be losing in terms of the shadow of the court, uh, and uh, what, what, what we may gain by focusing the court on a very few, a, a few number of situations. Now, now again, my, my, my answer to, um, I heard what uh, Jeremy said, and, and again, my, my answer is, uh, the bottom line is the resources are limited. The resources are limited. The court cannot do everything. Um, they are very, very limited. And it seems that the court cannot even uh, succeed in its very core mission, that I think we will all agree that this is the core mission of the court, to prosecute, to bring people to justice. Then we, we may argue that the court may also have additional objectives, such as posing a shadow and uh, encouraging states uh, so uh, it, uh, to, to conduct investigations and proceedings so that there will be a less, less impunity. But if the court will not succeed in its primary goal, the shadow effect will also uh, be much less uh, uh, effective. Now, a question that we should ask ourselves uh, after this experience of almost 20 years is whether international criminal law is the right answer for many, many troubling situations. I'm not saying that they are not troubling. I'm not saying that there are many uh, human rights violations around the world or issues that should be dealt with and addressed by international law. The question is whether the ICC is the answer for everything. And unfortunately, the answer given to that question in the last almost 20 years was, yes, ICC, 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 I hear it also in the government. Would it, everybody asks when, whenever there is a question of international law, would it interest the ICC or not? They ask me because I'm, I'm in charge of ICC issues, maybe. But this is not the only question. If we care about international humanitarian law, if we care about international human rights law, maybe, if the court would be more focused on the really heavy criminal cases, and this is, I think, the legacy of international criminal law, if you go back to Nuremberg and also to the ICTY and the ICTR, that's the real legacy of international criminal justice. We may pay a price, I admit, but we may think about ways for this price uh, not to be too, too heavy by re-engaging in a discourse about other fields of international law, about accountability in general, not necessarily criminal accountability. Um, so after trying this approach, uh, I think now, or, or, or the approach uh, that says that the court should do whatever it can, it can grasp or should take whatever the, it, it, it can possibly uh, uh, handle and it cannot, uh, now the approach will be different. I didn't mention, uh, I guess the, the next phase will be the, uh, the, panel, ab the panel about the uh, COVID-19, the coronavirus, but we shouldn't expect the court to have more budget in the next few years, but much less a, a budget. So again, in, without going into much ideology or big philosophies, the court will need to, hand, to, 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 to conduct itself with a very, very limited uh, budget and resources. And for that reason alone, the court should be very, very focused on which situations uh, it takes. Thank you. Ah, I, I, think, uh, I think, yeah, um, Jeremy also asked about the, um, about the proceedings uh, 
uh, regarding Israel in the ICC. I don't have much to say. I think Tal, uh, Tal mentioned uh, before, we are now a year after uh, uh, the judges, uh, after the prosecutors submitted uh, the request uh, to, the, to the judges. Uh, just maybe adding a little bit to what Tal said, I think the mere fact that the judges are deliberating for a year now shows that there is no firm and straightforward uh, jurisdictional ground uh, for the, uh, what is called the situation uh, in Palestine. And connecting that to the general discussion, again, we're in the panel about the Middle East for some reason. So <laughs> connecting that from the, to the general discussion about the uh, uh, independent expert review, I think it's clear also from a policy perspective that this is not a situation that the court should uh, pursue uh, in these uh, difficult uh, days. Thank you, Gilad. Francis, you had a follow-up question? No, I, I, I think that Jeremy pointed out to it, and actually, Gilad, you didn't fully uh, address it. The problem of uh, the claims, the accusations of regional bias. Um, of course, if you restrict the number of cases more, you're going to get a stronger basis for the claims of regional bias. Um, but you've already explained that you think that this is an inevitable result of scarce resources and, and, and the innate difficulty, um, the inherent difficulty of dealing with these international cases. So I regard it as answered. And, and, and I, I, those who are really engaged in ICC issue, uh, I can refer you uh, further to Francis' uh, question uh, to the uh, prosecutor statement regarding Nigeria made just recently and her report issued just recently about the UK. Two situations, the issue of complementarity arises with regard to both and I, I leave it to you. Uh, so so <laughs> I, I, I think we are still in a world in which arguments about political bias can, can be raised vis-a-vis uh, -vis the court today, it cannot be avoided because the court needs to be selective. It's better to be selective in terms of gravity, mass atrocities, being very clear on these issues, than being politically correct, so to say, and issue a lengthy report about the Gaza flotilla or about the investigations in the UK, instead of investing the resources in those really uh, important and, and shocking uh, situations. Okay. Thank you, Gilad. Um, so we have finished the panel, so join me in thanking all three presentations. And we will have a short break and come back in a quarter to five for the next panel. Thank you.